Hello and welcome to our webinar today, Treating Childhood Populations with LSVT Loud. We're so happy to have you join us from wherever you may be located globally. Today, the presenters for this webinar are myself, Angela Halpern. I am the Chief Clinical Officer for LSVT Global and one of the LSVT Loud faculty. The other co-presenter with me today is Dr. Cynthia Fox. She is the CEO and co-founder of LSVT Global and is an LSVT Loud and LSVT Big faculty. We have information here on our biographies. If you want to learn a little bit more, this is in your handout as well. We do fully disclose that Dr. Fox and I are employees of LSVT Global. We receive lecture honorarium and um, Dr. Fox has ownership interest in LSVT Global. We do also have a financial relationship that we have a preference for LSVT Loud as a treatment technique. Let's start with a few logistics. If you haven't joined one of our webinars before, how the webinars work is during the presentation, your microphones are muted. We will allow time at the end for questions. If at any point you have a question, you can feel free to type it into the question box in your control panel and um, we'll address those. Also at the end, you can feel free to raise your hand and we can unmute you and you can ask your question in that way. You will see in your control panel that there is a handout and that handout contains the slides that we will be presenting in today's webinar. So you can download that in the handouts on your control panel. At the end of the webinar, there will be a survey that will launch. We do ask if you could take just a few minutes to fill this out. It's short, it's quick. It really helps us um, with planning the webinars. Many of the topics for webinars are based on input people provide in this survey. And then let's talk briefly about continuing education units. This LSVT Global Webinar is not ASHA or state registered for CEUs for speech, physical, and occupational therapies, but you can use it for self-reported um, CEU credit as a non-registered, non-pre-approved CEU activity. So if you are a speech, physical, or occupational therapy professional and you would like to self-report your activity, simply email us at webinars at lsvtglobal.com and ask for a certificate after you have completed the webinar today. We'll then issue a certificate that you can use to self-report. You do need to attend the full hour if you would like to earn a certificate, and please do check with your state regarding individual licensing requirements for non-registered uh, CEUs, as this does differ state by state. We are so grateful for the funding that we have received to support some of the work that we're going to be talking with you about today. So the Cerebral Palsy International Research Foundation, LSVT Global, um, you see some other foundations listed here as well as the National Institutes of Health have provided funding for some of the research that we will discuss. So what do we hope you're going to learn during this next hour with us? At the end, that you would be able to state the rationale for applying LSVT Loud to childhood populations. That you would be able to recall the phase one and two research findings that we're going to discuss for LSVT Loud in these childhood populations and that you could walk through some decision-making steps for determining if a child might be a good candidate for LSVT Loud treatment. Before we dig into the content, we would like to um, take a little poll. This really helps us to know how to tailor the um, amount of details we give on certain slides and the information. So if you could please let us know, are you an LSVT Loud certified clinician, a speech language pathologist, but not LSVT Loud certified? If you're some other allied health professional, PT, OT, nursing, other, or perhaps you're a family member of a child with a speech disorder, 
or something that we haven't covered. So if you can go ahead and um, fill this in when this poll launches, that will really help us today. Okay, I'm closing the poll and we will share the results here. Okay, great. So it looks like this is very helpful information for us. The majority majority of you, speech language pathologists, um, not LSVT loud certified, and then we have a chunk of LSVT loud certified clinicians joining us as well. So we can really tailor this to our speech language pathologists here. And um, for those of you who are LSBT loud certified, as we go throughout this presentation, this is a higher level presentation. Just keep in mind that we do have a complete um, three hour course that you can also take that really goes in depth into some of these topics. So as we get started, what we know as speech therapists is that communication is important and essential. We're preaching to the choir here with all of you. As we delve into thinking about applications of LSVT loud to pediatric populations, we want to start by thinking about children with dysarthria consequent to cerebral palsy. So when we look at some common communication themes, we see that these kiddos want to be socially accepted. So their first choice is to try to use oral communication. So they're more like their peers. We see they continue to communicate orally even if they're not successful. And so then they become extremely frustrated if peers or adults fail to wait to understand the message and simply walk away. So there is a great need, but when we think about treatments available for these populations, we see there is limited research. So if you stop to think about why would we, why would LSBT loud be appropriate in this population, the what if, you may be thinking, why would we take a treatment that was originally developed for people with Parkinson's disease and apply it to CP? Well, let's walk through a bit of rationale and um, discussion with this next. So let's start with a case study in order to address this why. So you're going to, in a minute, hear some pre and post video, um, or sorry, audio clips, and you'll see in the video, spectrogram and waveform from a three year, 11 month old male who had cerebral palsy. It was a dyskinetic type. This individual was involved in all four limbs and cognition was normal, but there was some delayed language development. Before we play these clips for you, I want you to be thinking about as you listen to the audio, not only what do you hear as far as increased loudness, because in LSBT loud, we do target that increased loudness, but also changes that you might notice in articulation. And then visually be looking at the difference in the spectra and um, the waveform pre and post in the amplitude. So we'll just play these back to back and go ahead and listen to these now. I don't know. I don't know. So you could see that increased amplitude in the spectra and the waveform. You could hear it in the audio samples, and you could also hear those improvements, not just in loudness, but also in better articulation. So this leads us into thinking about why LSVT loud. And as you think about treatments that can be applied to a particular population, first step is how do you select and define a treatment and ensure its fidelity in your implementation? So the first step is to think about what are established treatment approaches that have research to support their effectiveness. Then what's the rationale for these approaches? Can that rationale for something that is already established fit the needs of the new population? 
We're going to get a bit more detailed now about the idea of applying the established protocol of LSVT Loud to these pediatric populations. So when we think about first what is the established what are established treatment protocols LSVT Loud has been around for over 30 years um, and has that 30 years of research to support its journey from invention to scale up. So when looking at established treatment protocols, we see LSVT Loud is well established. It is well researched. Um, and then you can see through this phase one, two, three, and clinical implementation implementation studies listed here that pediatric work, the idea to apply these LSVT loud concepts in pediatric populations actually began quite early in this process. And we'll be sharing some more of um, this development and research, <clears throat> excuse me, work with you in the upcoming slides. So if we think about the target of treatment for voice, why? Why would we want to use this focus of voice? So the key, one of the key components of LSVT Loud is we have a focus on a singular target of voice. And then through this, we're using increased amplitude as a single motor organizing theme across the system. So it's not just increased loudness. But what we see across populations is this idea of focusing on voice can help us to retrain respiratory laryngeal coordination. It can provide a tool for more efficient use of the motor speech system. For these populations, it helps them learn how to modulate and obtain better control and coordination. But keeping it simple through the singular focus on voice and increased loudness. So could we also then take the singular target of voice? Would it be beneficial in childhood dys dysarthria? So let's think about voice directly in some of these populations for children with CP and Down syndrome. When you consider the percep perceptual characteristics of voice and speech, we see that they can have consistent hypernasality. There might be a breathy voice quality. We hear vocal quality changes. They might have monotone voice and speech, an uncontrolled rate and rhythm of the voice, imprecise articulation. So this idea of directly targeting voice, one, yes, could enhance these vocal quality issues that we see, but then two, keep in mind what I was just talking about of using it to then be an organizer across the motor speech system. And as our colleague Carol Bullock says, perhaps voice may be a good point of entry to provide us with a foundation that then we can continue to build on for continued work. So one of the next components of LSBT Loud that makes it unique is the mode of treatment. It is intensive, it is high effort. So this intensive high effort mode of treatment delivery is an essential component of LSVT loud treatment. Why would we think this mode might be beneficial in childhood dysarthria? Well, intensive and high effort treatment is beneficial in these populations. When we look at treatment dependent neuroplasticity that occurs in a pediatric context, we see what's important. Intensive task repetitions. As I start to talk about LSVT in more detail in some following slides, you'll see how these principles fit nicely. We see that it's important to have progressive challenges to the learner with increasing difficulty. There needs to be a presence of motivators and rewards, but these rewards need to be internally driven, intrinsic. Active participation in the treatment process is important. There needs to be skill acquisition of a functional goal, and we'll touch on how this function is a large part of LSVT loud treatment, and the practice must be structured. So think about your own experiences of when you have seen success with your pediatric clients. And when we look at what are considered best practices for pediatric motor speech disorders, 
the majority of speech language pathologists specializing in pediatric motor speech disorders agree that this intensive motor speech treatment, regardless of the subsystem you're targeting, is the preferable mode of delivery. So for those of you who are not as familiar with LSVT Loud, we're just going to touch on an overview of what happens in a treatment session. So LSVT Loud treatment is delivered four consecutive days a week for four weeks. Each of the sessions are one hour and they are individual. They incorporate multiple repetitions. There is daily home practice, so people learn how to independently, internally use the voice and speech techniques outside of the treatment room, and daily carryover exercises to directly get into a focus on function right away in practicing those tasks. It's important that people learn how to do these on their own so they can develop a lifelong habit of practice. So we mentioned that the training mode of LSVT Loud is intensive and high effort, and we discussed that this intensity is important for neuroplasticity. So you can see the intensity is reflected here. Let's briefly now look at what happens in a treatment session. The, really the important thing to keep in mind as we go through this is no matter the population, LSVT loud is LSVT loud is LSVT loud. We are delivering the protocol the same way. So when we think in more detail of the components that we touched on earlier that are necessary for neuroplasticity in pediatric populations, we can really see how nicely this LSVT loud protocol fits these requirements. So through the daily exercises that we do, the first daily exercise is the sustained bowel phonation. Uh, we're doing multiple repetitions, getting that intensity. We're targeting the monotonicity in the voice and getting that increased intensity through maximum fundamental frequency range exercises, again done with multiple repetitions. And then focusing on function, having the um, clients come up with things they say every day and repeating those multiple times. And then when we think also about what's important for neuroplasticity, it's a progression in complexity in a structured way. And so through the speech hierarchy, we start simple at a word phrase level and gradually get more complex through week four of treatment to conversation. Saliency is embedded in everything we do to promote internal motivators and functional communication. So let's look more specifically on that focus on function. So the goal is that the child will automatically use this improved voice in daily living and that it lasts over time. Throughout the treatment session, activities are salient, whether it's our reading, our conversation, our carryover activities, they're personal and salient for that individual to drive those neuroplasticity principles. Throughout the um, carryover exercises, we're giving them functional activities to use outside of the treatment room to get a positive impact on voice and speech reactions from other people. So with the voice exercises, they are tools to facilitate improved loudness. So as they're doing ah, uh, as they're doing ah, uh, we're not just exercising to exercise, but it's using that voice to then translate into a louder voice in conversation. So my goal isn't that the child can call grandma and say, ah, uh, my goal is the child can call grandma, use the effort in that ah uh, voice and say, hi grandma, in a voice that can be heard and understood. Calibration is important to get this voice that we work on in the treatment room to translate outside of the treatment room. Because the real world long-term goal is that the patient is, the child is using this voice functionally in their everyday communication. For those of you who are LSVT Loud certified, when you first learned LSVT Loud, you learned that calibration in Parkinson's disease was related to the sensory mismatch. So you may be thinking, well, children with dysarthria don't have the sensory mismatch. So 
why do I need to do calibration? Well, calibration is just as important. We're asking them to talk in a new way. They need to practice to know the effort, the loudness required for improved communication and have these opportunities to use the new voice to receive that positive reinforcement as they talk at home, talk at school, talk on the phone, talk in their sports or social activities. So we're going to show you a video now that has some treatment clips across the different components of an LSVT loud treatment session. So you get an idea of the application of daily exercises and the hierarchy in this population. Oh, perfect, Ms. Katie. So what we're gonna do is you're gonna give me a nice big Ah, ah, whoa, Amazing. what did you get? I got 9.53. Good. Are you ready with your big, beautiful voice? Yes. Okay. just gives you a short snippet of a one hour treatment session where you would have done the whole protocol across the Oz and then she was reading her 10 functional phrases of things that were important for her to say and then doing a salient conversation activity with her mom. So I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Fox and she's going to walk you through some of the research data for these studies. Thank you, Angela, and welcome everybody. It's a delight to have you joining us today to learn more really about this exciting application of LSVT Loud to pediatric populations. So what you see now is an overview of the studies we've done in our particular uh, laboratory and with our, in our groups related to pediatric populations. Our first two phase one studies were single subject, multiple baseline case series designs. We had children with cerebral palsy and children with Down syndrome. And in these studies, we collected data such as ratings from the parents, listener perception of the child's speech before and after treatment, and acoustic data. We then expanded, expanded beyond that to phase two studies. In these studies, we had two different cohorts or groups of children with cerebral palsy, ranging first from six to 10 years and then from eight to 16 years. We also included typically developing peers as a comparison. We collected similar parent ratings, listener perception, and acoustic data, but we added in physiological measures and neural imaging. And this was in collaboration with Dr. Carol Bullock. We do not have the time to go through each one of these studies, so I'll just pick a few highlights to share with you in the webinar today. My slide will advance here. Oops. Okay, so in any phase one research, our real goal is to detect the presence of a therapeutic effect. As such, we um, oftentimes have no control groups, um, no comparative treatments, and we're really just trialing the treatment to see does anything change. So that was our first study that we conducted. 
In this study, we had a single subject, multiple baseline design in children with cerebral palsy. We measured again, acoustics, listener perception, and parent ratings. And we had five children with a predominantly spastic type cerebral palsy and dysarthria, and they were five to seven years of age. In the listener perceptual study, basically listeners blinded to the condition, whether it was pre, post, or follow-up, listened to pairs of three samples of a, pre, of a sentence in one condition, followed by three samples of a sentence in the, another condition. And then they rated them for a number of variables such as preferred loudness, loudness variability, voice quality, articulatory precision. So in this next clip, I'm going to play two of those samples, the two highlighted in blue, the female who was five year, 10 months old with a mild to moderate uh, dysarthria. Again, you'll hear three repetitions pre, three repetitions post. That will be followed by a male, seven years, seven months, who is much more severe, a moderate to severe dysarthria. In his case, the sentence was by Bobby a puppy. He was not able to repeat the entire sentence. So you will hear the single word puppy three times pre, three times post. Pair six, sample A. The blue spot is on the key. The blue spot is on the key. The blue spot is on the key. Sample B. The blue spot is on the key. The blue spot is on the key. The blue spot is on the key. Sample B. Poopy, poopy, poopy. Pair seven, sample A. Puppy, puppy, puppy. Okay, so you could hear some pretty um, good differences between the two samples, the pre to the post. And listeners also heard those samples. And for the majority of samples preferred treated either immediately post or follow up for the um, preference of, again, things like loudness, articulatory precision. So when we come to the question that we asked in that study, do listeners prefer treated samples over baseline speech samples of children with cerebral palsy? The answer was yes. So we moved on from there for cerebral palsy to phase two studies where we further defined and refined our protocol and measures, and we actually did include uh, control groups. But before we go there, let's listen to our phase one work in children with Down syndrome. In these children, we, these are looking at group data now, pre-treatment in the black bar, post-treatment in the yellow bar for a measure of decibels of sound pressure level, which is an acoustic measure of loudness, the higher up, the louder of the voice. And the task was picture description. And we saw a significantly increase in vocal loudness from pre to post-treatment on this picture description task. Similar to the audio samples with the microphone signal and spectrogram that you saw for the child with cerebral palsy with Angela, we'll look at a video clip now where we see the repetition of the sentence, I need help from a little girl, five years old, pre, and that will be followed by her microphone signal, spectrogram, and audio clip of her saying that same sentence immediately post-treatment. I need help. I need help. I need the help. I need the help. So similar to what we heard in the child with Down syndrome, I mean with cerebral palsy, as well as the clips I just played, we're seeing a pattern that yes, the children are getting louder, but they're not talking too loud. They're they're going from something that was very soft to something that now has a good 
vocal signal, a foundation to it. But also in some cases, we're hearing a bit of that spillover of that effort into articulatory precision. And so those are all pretty classic examples of when we see positive outcomes in these children of what they look like in terms of spectrogram, mic signal, as well as what they sound like. We did um, acoustic parent rating and per listener perception as well as speech intelligibility in our phase two work. I'm not going to share that with you here today. Rather, I wanna share some of the, I think more unique data that were collected. And those were our physiological and neurological measures. These were collected pre, immediately post, as well as at a follow-up session that was 12 weeks after the conclusion of therapy. We collected uh, surface EMG, chest wall EMG, as well as respiratory measures using respiratory bands. That's what you see in the um, pictures on the left-hand side. And then we also collected imaging, both structural as well as functional. Once again, I won't go through all of those measures. I'm just going to highlight one physiological measure and then we'll look at some imaging changes. This was a measure of looking at changes in respiratory function pre to post treatment. On the left-hand side in the blue bars are the typically developing kids. So these are the children without cerebral palsy. The first set of bars on the top is time one pre, the second set of bars is time two. Now they did not have treatment, but it was one month later. And then the third set of bars is for uh, the follow-up. On the top graph in the blue section is for the ah task. And immediately below that is for sentence repetition. So what you can see is the pattern of lung volume initiation and lung volume termination during either an ah or a sentence repetition task for the typically developing kids. On the right hand side, we have the same setup in terms of time one, time two, times three, phonation on the top, sentence repetition on the bottom, but these are for the children with cerebral palsy. And if we look at the pre pattern, in particular for the maximum phonation, what we see is they have a reduced total lung volume excursion. They're not going as high in their breath to start or as low in their breath to finish. And after treatment, as well as follow-up, we see an improvement in that that's moving in the direction of what the typically developing children look like. In addition, for sentence repetition, immediately post-treatment, we see that the children are using a strategy of, taking in more air, starting at the higher end of their lung volume initiation, which may be one way that they were contributing to having a louder voice as they spoke. So these data are, once again, they're, they're quite unique and they give us insight into the mechanism of change for how, first of all, these children differ from their typically developing peers, and then how they're making biomechanical adjustments after treatment that support some of the increased loudness that we hear when we listen to those auditory um, audio samples. Next up, we're going to talk about neural changes. And this, this work was really led by Dr. Carol Bullock, who you see pictured here. There are two publications that I have listed on the slide. And in these two publications, first of all, one is looking at changes in white matter integrity, so white fiber tract changes pre, post, follow-up treatment in these children. And the other study is looking more at changes in brain activity in terms of functional MRI. Dr. Bullock is an expert at these studies. And so instead of me explaining to them to you, we're going to listen to Dr. Bullock explain them in an interview I recently conducted with her. So this is about a four minute video, but she will give you a beautiful summary of what to me is extraordinarily unique data to have pre post follow up imaging in these pediatric populations.
tell us about the imaging study, because I know that you had these children not only do it once, not twice, but actually three times, which I think is just so heroic. And I have so much respect for the work that you've done. So we looked at first structural and we looked at white matter uh, tract, fiber tract integrity. And this is important because this is sort of the electrical system of the brain. And there's some nifty ways to take pictures of that system using water diffusion tensor imaging. So it's a type of neuroimaging. And we can actually look at the white matter fiber tracks in association areas that link brain regions together as well as things like the cortical spinal tract, which is important for speech motor control. And what we found is that after treatment in these children with cerebral palsy is that immediately after treatment, we see a change in integrity of the white matter tracks in the cortical spinal tract. So this would be motor execution basically. And after this long-term use over three months, we see a change in association tracks particularly in the cingulate, which is an important region that integrates a lot of information and, and evaluates it. And so this is really, really important because it can take information like attention and information about memory. And we think it has to do with, am I doing it right? You know, is this what I was trained to do? The brain is saying, I know I was trained to do this. Is this, is this am I doing it right? And so it's a, it's a nice integrated area of the brain that we saw a change in. So that was that made a lot of sense to us by the way treatment and calibration is delivered. And then to look at function, we did functional MRI, which many, uh, many students may be familiar with. Um, and again, we wanted to look at fast phase or right after treatment changes and long phase or slow phase changes. And so immediately before treatment, we got, put all the children in the scanner and had them actually do speaking tasks in the scanner. And I must tell you that children with cerebral palsy are real troopers and, and they just did great. And so while we took pictures while they were speaking and what we found basically was before treatment, their activity was a lot lower than their control counterparts. Before treatment, they had a lot of networks that, that just really looked like a bowl of spaghetti. And we think that what they were giving themselves some feedback and what they actually produce were interfering with each other. And so after treatment, what we saw was a starting of pruning away some of those networks. Like they weren't very efficient and we were really enhancing those that were effective and efficient for speaking. And so we saw some really nice effects in the sensory motor area. And we saw some really nice um, effects in the somatosensory area. And so what this means is that all of the calibration that's incited by the therapist, hear how that sounds, feel how that feels, really enhance the connectivity between, between the perception of movement in space and feeding that out to the motor system and also feeding it to a little checking system in the brain in the cingulate gyrus that says, I'm paying attention. Did I do that right? It's an error detection kind of mechanism. And we saw that happening over the long term in these children. So calibration is working and it is changing the way the network is, is functioning in the brains of these children. So that's quite exciting. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that as much as I do, hearing about those changes in neural functioning. And I always like to remind people, this is why intensive treatment is so important. And when you're sitting in therapy sometimes and going, do I really have to do this this intensively? Our ability to potentially rewire in some aspects neural functioning, hopefully underlying more functional communication, is really that motivation for that intensive type of effort. So in summary of the research, and again, I just gave you a few little nuggets uh, of the studies, but what we found is that in general, 
for most children, not all children, we had a therapeutic effect. So nothing about the treatment was harmful and we're seeing some positive changes. We also observe physiological effects. We shared with you a little bit about what we saw in the respiratory system. We also saw changes that help us understand how the kids are making these um, adjustments in terms of muscular effort. And finally, we gained some insight into neurobiological changes that are most likely related to the treatment that we're delivering. So all of which support and justify the use of LSVT loud and select children with cerebral palsy and Down syndrome with potential application to other childhood populations. This is a summary of the published research that's come from our group. Again, case studies, single subject design, small group designs. We're really at the point now that the treatment and our understanding would be ready for a randomized controlled trial where now we're comparing this treatment next to another treatment to see is there something special about one or the other. So hopefully in the future, that will be where the research continues to grow. Now let's talk about a few high level ideas about how do we decide, is LSVT loud appropriate for a childhood population? For those of you who are LSVT loud certified, this is very similar to our decision tree when we think about applying this to adults who do not have Parkinson disease. And certainly in our training courses, we, we go through this process in, in much more detail, but this is just a high level consideration. First of all, LSVT loud is not for everyone, and that is not what we are suggesting, but it is a solid neuro-based treatment that is another good tool in your clinical toolbox. So considerations include the medical diagnosis of the child. We would conduct stimulability testing and see what those results are. Looking at our clinical judgment, as well as client and family discussions. These should all collectively guide the decision to progress with treatment or not. In terms of stimulability testing, um, this is something that we do, a dynamic assessment would be another word for that, but we try out the target of vocal loudness across a variety of tasks. This would include sustained phonation of the ahs, the high-low ahs, again, a multiple repetition, seeing how the child responds, what happens to voice, and then as well, we want to put that into speech. Again, multiple repetitions, anywhere from one to three word phrases, listening, observing, and seeing what happens. We say during stimulability testing, pull out all the stops. <clears throat> you wanna model, cue, motivate, try all the tools you would during a treatment session because our ultimate goal is to see, is there any glimmer that says, yes, this is a treatment approach that we should try. If you like something that you've seen during the stimulability testing session, then we encourage you to move forward with trial treatment. And trial treatment involves four consecutive treatment sessions. So basically completing the full of week one and then evaluating the impact. You don't want to do less than that because you really want to give it a, an honest to goodness try to see what will happen with treatment. Oftentimes as well, when we're doing trial treatment, we actually have the whole month scheduled because if we like what we see, we don't want to have an interruption. Um, so we would keep going. In this trial treatment, we're, we're paying attention. Can the child understand and approximate the instructions? Do they show signs of motivation and engagement? Is there compliance with the homework and carryover exercises? And do you hear changes in vocal loudness, vocal quality, articulatory effort, or other elements of speech? If you like what you see in the week of stimulability uh, trial treatment, then continue with treatment. As you go along, be sure you document your changes. These are things like duration, decibels of sound pressure level, frequency or pitch, 
the amount of queuing that is needed, and we're monitoring progress. So our perception of voice quality, the family's perception of communication participation, and the child's perception of changes in voice, in speech, and communication participation. For stimulability testing, we say give everyone a chance. Don't discount successful treatment options just because a condition is severe, advanced, or complex. In fact, that is most often when people pull out LSVT loud because they don't know what else to do. And some of the outcomes can be very impressive. Functional oral communication of any kind, even if it's, you know, 20, um, functional phrases that the child can say that others can understand can dramatically improve quality of life in severely disordered communication, even if supplementation through augmentative communication is also required. We recently conducted a short survey of our LSVT Loud certified clinicians who have actually completed our three-hour pediatric training course. And we looked back at that, about 30 of those clinicians responded, of whom about 50% of them had actually had the opportunity to apply LSVT to pediatric populations. What you see here are the different populations that they've tried. The two we've talked about at top, cerebral palsy and Down syndrome. Other populations, ataxia, vocal nodules, autism, apraxia. And then the other category, we had severe phonological disorders, uh, general motor speech disorders, tracheostomy, spinal cord injury, neuromuscular disease, and stroke TBI. So a wide range, and again, for each one, you would go through that process of clinical decision-making with stimulability testing and trial treatment. In that same survey, we were curious, so we asked, what was the most surprising or rewarding about using LSVT loud in childhood populations? And these were some of the more common comments. The improvement that they saw in intelligibility. And again, with LSVT Loud, our focus is on voice, but we see that spread of effects to articulatory effort, which can also impact intelligibility. It's also important to consider that audibility, the ability to be heard, is a big piece of intelligibility. So sometimes even just being able to increase the child's loudness to a normal level can have a very positive impact in terms of speech intelligibility. They were also surprised how much the children enjoyed the exercises, their gain in confidence and communication, that they had this real intrinsic buy-in to the treatment and motivation and the empowerment the children gained. Also, one of our clinicians who works a lot with bilingual children talked about the non-targeted behaviors, um, articulation, initiation of conversation, but also use of the techniques in the language that was not targeted in the treatment sessions. So in closing, let's talk just a few real world considerations. Again, in our training courses, we go into much more depth, but these might be a few things you're thinking about. Are intensive protocols really possible in a, in a pediatric population? And the answer is absolutely yes. They may take a little scheduling, but they are possible. In particular, if they're evidence-based. If you provide clinical outcomes and document consistent functional improvements, utilizing subjective family, child, teacher reports and surveys, and you may need to spend some time educating administration, physicians, family, insurance to get the protocol set up, but it is absolutely possible. I think what's more important to consider is honestly how practical they are. And what we mean by that, when you do intensive treatment, you see results quickly and results equal motivation. And that is something we see so wildly, not just in the children, but also in adults. And so it's a wonderful tool to have efficient and fast improvements. The other thing that we see, again, for kids is that a bad day of therapy 
which you will have, can be immediately followed by a good one because you're seeing the child every day or four days a week. And it also immediately establishes accountability, accountability to the treatment, to the exercises, to the homework, and to the carryover practice. As I mentioned, you have good days and bad days, but stay the course. So we really work to set the tone of how much we will work in the session with the child the very first day. We also spend a good deal of time educating everyone before treatment starts. The family, the children, um, anybody else who's involved, they know the intensity, they know the homework, and they may not be able to start the treatment immediately. We may have to have a delay, wait until there's a time in everyone's schedule when the intensive treatment will work. Two steps forward, one step back, that's not uncommon. You may be making progress and then have a complete meltdown day. And, and again, that's okay, just keep going and that's the beauty of intensive treatment. And when those meltdown days happen, having confidence in yourself and the child. And that's where the research data comes into play. We see the outcomes in research that gives us confidence to keep chugging along, even if we're having some self-doubts. And it's worth the effort. And I think the children feel that way as well as we do as therapists. In terms of reinforcement, we really prioritize what we call the intrinsic reinforcement of success. That's all about with the child validating their new voice. And we're constantly saying, oh, that voice sounds great. That's the voice that will help people understand you. Did you feel how that feels? That's what you need to feel when you talk so people can understand you. I like that voice. That voice gives you power and confidence. So we're really tuning them internally, how it feels, how it sounds, and how that good that is and how motivating that is. So by making those intrinsic rewards 90% of the session, I think that's where we get to those comments from the clinicians I shared previously, that they were surprised how much the kids intrinsically bought in to the treatment session. And again, they see changes they see improvements and that becomes motivating. Now, of course, extrinsic rewards are needed sometimes, you know, stickers, bribing, whatever it takes, but save that for when the child is really failing, um, which oftentimes happens more in week two and week three, the grind weeks. And when we don't need it, stick with the motor practice, stick with the intrinsic rewards. And these kids work, work, work. They are exhausted uh, in week one and week two at the end of treatment, but they gain endurance and they don't need nearly as much external reinforcement as we tend to give. So that's something, again, we discuss in more detail in the detailed training sessions. So in summary for you all today, there is a solid rationale for using LSVT Loud in childhood populations. They need Certain kids need a voice focus, it's neuroplasticity principled, and we focus on their functional goals. There's emerging evidence across acoustic, perceptual, physiological, neural, and patient report that all support the use of this treatment in select childhood populations. We can follow a systematic decision-making process, including stimulability testing and trial treatment to decide if LSVT LAD is appropriate for a child or not in some cases. And then we say embrace creative practical implementation ideas to be successful. Don't diminish fidelity of neuroplasticity and evidence-based treatments with alternative dosages that are not effective. Okay, I'd like to acknowledge uh, our LSVT team of researchers, as well as the team at the University of Alberta in Edmonton under the direction of Ka Dr. Carol Bullock. This work is difficult. It takes a long time. It's oftentimes messy and it takes giant teams to make it happen. So we're very grateful for the contributions of everyone um, that has helped us develop the research base that we have today. 
At this time, we will open it up to your questions. So you can start right now typing your questions into the question box in your controlled panel. And we will read those aloud and go through and answer them one by one. You can also, if you have a more complicated question, raise your hand, click the little raise your hand. We can call out your name, unmute your microphone, and you can ask your question out loud. If you don't have a question right now, but as soon as you end this show, you go, oh, I have a question. You can email it at any time to info at lsvtglobal.com. While you're typing those questions in and asking those questions, we invite you uh, and your clients actually to next month's webinar. This next month, the intended audience is individuals with Parkinson disease or other conditions. And it's calibration, the heart of success for LSVT big and LSVT loud treatments. That'll be on Wednesday, June 23rd at our regular 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And we'll open it up for questions, but at the top of the hour, we will conclude. When you exit out of the webinar, a survey should automatically launch. As Angela said, if you can please take the time to complete that survey, it's really very beneficial to us to develop webinars that are beneficial to you. So Angela, I'll send it over to you. And do we have any particular questions that have come in so far? We do not have any questions yet. So people are probably either thinking, or as you said, there might be things that occur, but I do not see any that have popped in yet. Okay, I see a hand raised for Beverly. It's been up for a while, but Beverly, do you have a question you would like to ask? I can. Yes, I would like to. I'd like Perfect. to ask what what type of games then do you suggest for the, uh, the CP children? Games in terms of activities? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Oh, there's all kinds of activities. And um, again, we, we have lists that we'll, we share in our pediatric training. Um, most importantly, we tend to see what, what do the kids love, um, which is a huge variety. Um, but we can play any kind of games they like. I, I think one of the big things that I find to be the best is movement any kind of movement. I, I do not like staying at the desk. We mm -hmm. get on the floor, we bounce on balls, lay down, upside down, um, uh, have them, you know, walk distances as they do their awe and see if you can go further and further. I love the game Kerplunk. Um, I don't know if you remember that, but the little sticks are in the, the tower and the marbles are on top of it. And so anytime they don't use their good voice, I pull a stick. Um, so there's an endless, I think, um, it, it, it's your creativity about what types of interactions you can use. And I don't know, Angela, if you've got some other um, ideas that you found were most beneficial. Sure. And as Cynthia mentioned, it is about saliency. So looking at, um, we find out before we start treatment, what are the interests of the patient to get that saliency to translate over outside of the treatment room? And so then I would incorporate games around their hobbies, their interests. Sometimes the parents could bring in, if it were action figures that that particular child liked, or, um, you know, certain books that were really motivating to them. And as Cynthia said the movement um, when I did treatment with the children with Down syndrome was also very important. We never sat still. Um, we were always, we'd lay on the floor, move our legs up for highs and lows or do cars on the wall to do highs and lows, um, throwing balls as they did functional phrases. So that really keeps the kiddos engaged. Thank you. You're welcome. Absolutely. And um, we did have another question come in. Oh, sorry. Were yeah. you going to? Yes, I was just about to see. I saw um, Dr. Insalaco. Um, great to see you on there. Dr. Deborah Insalaco and I did our PhDs together many, many years ago. Uh, so uh, she asked about um, telepractice. And so how about telepractice? 
absolutely 100%. Um, telepractice can be a beautiful way to deliver treatment with the kids. Um, during you know COVID, I know some therapists did all of the treatment through telepractice. In some cases, with some kids, it might be you know two of the four sessions for the week. You know, you come in two days a week, you do telepractice two days a week, but it is a wonderful tool and it definitely helps, I think, with the practicality in terms of scheduling, geographical barriers. We know many of these families have um, lots of kids and busy schedules, so that, that can be a wonderful way to deliver the treatment. Okay. Good. Well, I see we are right at the top of the hour, and it looks like we have all of our questions answered. So, um, Angela, I'll let you close the show. Great. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Um, it was really a pleasure to spend this time with you. If you have further questions, feel free to email us at info at. We really hope that you join future webinars, and um, we appreciate the time today. Thanks, everyone, and don't, please don't forget to take that survey that should launch when you leave the webinar.